and she is a faith community nurse, and she's also a certified advanced planning, advanced care planning Plan. facilitator. Yeah. It's kind of a mouthful. Yeah. So, so I'm happy <laughs> that you're here, and I hope that you will just give a little bit more of a background on yourself too as well. Okay. So, thanks, Barb. Um, well, as um, Jane said, I am a nurse. I'm an, a registered nurse. I graduated from a school a little bit further north than here. Uh -huh. But <laughs> anyway. Um, but I'm also a faith community nurse. Um, I have kind of a variety of background in my nursing career, but I was a faith community nurse for 15 years at a church here in Fargo. And then um, just recently, became, about two years ago, came on staff at Sanford. And advanced care planning, and I will talk a little bit about this, um, is a, a very personal decision, but it sometimes can be a very faith-filled decision too, so it fits well with faith community nursing. And, um, but part of my job at Sanford is to do advanced care planning with um, those out in the community, those um, patients at Sanford. And we do this as a community benefit, not um, just for Sanford patients. So we will do that for Essentia patients, VA patients, um, those that are receiving care from Hospice of the Red River Valley, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But, um, so advanced care planning was, um, has really taken a change. You may have heard of living wills, advanced health directives, uh, medical power of attorney, lots of different terms. And sometimes that can be very, very confusing. And people are like, well, I, I think I have that done. I maybe have that done. And in the past, too, when you've maybe gone for a clinic appointment, it has been kind of a, a check mark that gets done on your chart. Your, um, um, clinic provider may have said to you, do you have a living will? And you may say yes, and they say, okay, great, and then you move on. Or they may, you may say no, and they say, oh, okay, and they move on. <laughs> but we've really tried to make this more of a process, more of, um, as our sign says there, changing conversations, changing culture. And we have a 5013C in North Dakota that is made up of different representatives from different health institutions in North Dakota called, and it's called Honoring Choices North Dakota. And this has been modeled after Honoring Choices Wisconsin, which was born out of the Gunderson Health System in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with La Crosse, Wisconsin, but it's the city much like Fargo-Moorhead. But it's sometimes referred to as the city that talks about death. Now, we maybe don't want to be referred to as that, but they have done a phenomenal job with the um, getting health care directives written with the advanced care planning process. In La Crosse, Wisconsin, 96% of their residents age 18 and over have a health care directive. That's phenomenal. Nationwide, the average is 30% of people over the age of 18. Now here in Fargo-Moorhead, it is 27%. So we have much work to do. And as I said, it's about changing the, that conversation, changing the culture, really having people talk about what they would want at their end of life. And we don't want to just talk about end of life. We really want to refer to it as living well and dying well really kind of normalizing it. And I'll talk more about that. But hopefully everybody in the room got a folder. If you didn't, if you could raise your hand. But it looks like everybody did. I just want to point out what's in there and I um, will come back to maybe some of those um, pieces of paper that are in the folder. But just to let you know what you do have. We do have a copy of an advanced health care directive. Um, we have really tried to normalize the um, document, have the same document across different health systems. And we have really tried to simplify this. Maybe some of you in the room have written your health care directive, and you maybe did this maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and it was really um, quite written in legalese, and it was really maybe hard to understand. I know even just a couple years ago when I started in this position and I was helping people write their health care directives, um, sometimes I questioned, like, 
what are we supposed to put in this blank? But we've really simplified the form, made it much easier to understand. And then on, also on the left-hand side, there is a pink um, evaluation. If you wouldn't mind doing that at the end, that would be great. That would be very helpful. On the right-hand side of your packet, um, we do have a document about starting the conversation. And you're going to hear me refer to that often during this presentation, about how important the conversation is that you have with your loved ones, with family members, with friends. And then um, some of you may have this document. We kind of maybe have two different types of packets. You have this document or a document that has a lot of red lettering on the top of it. And that's really the nuts and bolts of writing a healthcare directive. Really tells you the things you need to address. And then there's information about scheduling an individual consultation. And um, as I said earlier, that's a community benefit that Sanford has. Essentia has that also. The VA has it also. So whatever health system you might utilize for your health care, they do want to get health care directives done and on your electronic record. So there's information about scheduling an individual consultation. We also gave you a small card when you came in. And if you would um, like us to call you to schedule um, a consultation, we can do that. There's information about group sessions that we hold at Sanford. And really what you're doing today is one of the group sessions. So you don't need to attend one of those, but we would welcome you back if you would like to. But if you want to share that information with anybody, um, you can certainly do that. And then there's information about tissue and organ donation. And that is part of um, a piece that you need to address in writing your health care directive. So for right now, I'd like you to just sit back in your chair. I want you to do some thinking, reflecting on some statements that I am going to say. And I know that for some, some of these statements may be upsetting. You maybe have been in this position. You maybe have been faced with this in the past. I'm not saying these to upset you, but to get you thinking, um, to possibly um, spur you on to write your health care directive. So just sit back. Imagine that you're in the hospital and you cannot speak. Soon you won't be able to swallow or breathe. Who will speak for you? Imagine that your mother, your husband, your child, has slipped into a coma and is not expected to recover. Who will make decisions for them? Do you know their wishes? Imagine that you have Alzheimer's, a brain injury, heart disease, cancer. Who will speak for you if you can't speak for yourself? We all hope to communicate until the very end. It doesn't always happen this way. It's time to speak up now. Did you know that 90% of Americans have heard of a living will? 71% of Americans have thought about their end of life preferences, but only 29% have a living will. Without a plan, your health care team won't know your wishes. Your family may not know what to do. And this produces stress, anxiety, and possibly family discord. We may ask, am I doing the right thing for mom or dad? Advanced care planning, conversations, decisions, it's how we care for each other. Think about what is right for you, what is meaningful to you. Spiritual support, having family nearby, being at home. Tell someone. Name a health care agent. What else? Become educated. Remove any barriers. Get the forms. Have conversations. Review and update your forms periodically. It's time to start the conversation. Make sure your voice is heard. So we are going to start the conversation right now. So how many of you here today got here in a car? And how many of you in that car had a spare tire? 
Hopefully, yes. Um, <laughs> and how many of you have had a flat tire in the past and have had to rely on that spare tire? Yes. So, you had a plan just in case you had a spare tire. So, how many of you in this room think that you might die one day? <laughs> yeah. And I'm not trying to be irreverent about that. I'm not trying to, um, you know, surprise you by that. <laughs> um, obviously, I didn't because you all raised your hands. But um, hopefully, that won't happen soon, but it will happen at some point in our life. And we, um, in America, don't like to talk about death. We kind of try to keep putting it off. Here in America, we have really medicalized um, the dying process. And that really has just happened in the last 30 to 50 years. And we do know that life can change quickly. We have been very blessed in America with lots of um, advancement in medical treatments. But that has also maybe prolonged our suffering, prolonged maybe um, not how we want to live. So we're going to talk about um, the conversations that need to take place, the importance of making a plan. I'm passionate about this because my father, who had multiple health issues, um, died right before my senior year of college. And um, we were faced, my mother and I were standing in the hallway one day, not one day, kind of, but we were standing in the hallway and we had to make a very quick decision about whether to do CPR for my father. Now this was about 35 years ago, before we did advanced care planning, before we had health care directives. And I really, truly believe no family should have to stand in the hallway and make that very quick decision. Now, fast forward about 35 years, and my mother, who lived to be 96, we were very blessed. Um, she did talk about what she wanted at end of life. She talked about what medical treatments she did and did not want, sometimes to her grandchildren's chagrin. But <laughs> we knew when she passed away exactly um, what she wanted at her end of life. And we could truly celebrate her life and not mourn the decisions that we had to make quickly. So I hope today what you will take away is that it's very, very important for you to um, have conversations with your family. It's important for you to get that document written and get it on your medical record. Um, but it's um, important too that you review it and that this is a process and not just a check mark. And I hope it's very exciting in this room to see such a variety of ages. It's important that um, we don't think of it that we just do this when we're maybe advanced in years or when we maybe know that we have some health issue, but that we do advanced care planning when we're age 18 or above. Um, it's really important for um, college students as they leave home to write a health care directive, even if it's just appointing who will speak for them if they cannot speak for themselves. Um, we do know that many times family situations are very different. It's not the nuclear family. And you may not want maybe your parent to speak for you. Maybe you would want um, a different family member to speak for you. So it's really important that um, as we turn 18 that we do get our health care directive written. So we may have lots of different images of death. We may want to maybe go to sleep one night and not wake up. That's maybe the kind of ideal thing. But we also know that we could either be in a, an accident and our family may need to make decisions for us. Or we may have kind of a slow progressive health condition that we really um, shows very slow deterioration and we will need to make decisions about our health care. And it's just so important that we get those um, decisions written down, get what our wishes are, get our, what our values are, what our preferences are. Um, it's a good time to visit about hospice care, palliative care. And um, it's just important that we don't put that off, writing that down. It's a legacy that we can leave for our family, letting them know what we want. It's a way to pass on our faith. It's a way to pass on what we value, a way to pass on family history also. 
So some of us probably have gone on a vacation in the past, and we probably have an idea about what our ideal vacation would be. And it's a very personal thing. We may um, have a friend who has just a completely different idea about what a personal vacation would be. Many times spouses disagree about what, a uh, what a, an ideal vacation is. But um, we will probably agree that to go on an ideal vacation, it takes a lot of planning. And um, it takes planning, too, with how, what we want at end of life. In America, we plan for everything. Just think about when someone announces that they're, going, they're expecting a baby, a new life, and what all the planning that goes in and all the preparations. And then we plan for graduations, we plan for marriages, we plan for vacations, but we really avoid planning for our end of life. We avoid the conversation. So we'll kind of, hopefully this today will help with how you can maybe have that conversation, have, um, be um, ready to have that conversation. So now, what is advanced care planning? As I said earlier, it's a process. Um, where you write down what your wishes are, what you value. It's, a, um, converse, it's about the conversation that you will have with those that you are close to. And um, I, a couple weeks ago I did this presentation and I had a priest in the audience. And we have that on there that hope is not a plan. And we all need to have hope, hope in any situation. But he said, you know, I have had so many people tell me that they are just, they're not going to write one of these directives because they're just going to leave it up to God and then everything will get taken care of. He said, and I, I thought it was great because it came from a priest, but he said, you know, when you don't write it down what you want, you're not really leaving it up to God. You're leaving it up to people who don't even know you, who maybe don't even care about you. So he, I said, can you come on the road with me? But no. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. It is just so important to write down what your wishes are. So it's, it, the advanced care planning process is about learning about the treatment options for your particular health condition, reflecting on your values about what is important to you, what are your personal and spiritual beliefs, what really matters to you, what are your hopes and your wishes for your health care, what makes your life worth living, and then deciding on what, treat, what types of healthcare treatment you want or do not want, talking about your decisions with your healthcare agent, your loved ones, your healthcare providers, um, your faith leader, and then documenting your wishes. And it's important to note that every state recognizes healthcare directives. If you write a healthcare directive in North Dakota and you travel to Arizona, it will be honored. If you um, there's, each state maybe has little different requirements, but they're so minimal. In North Dakota, probably the biggest thing that you need to know is that if you write a health care directive and you appoint who your health care agent is, they need to sign off on the directive that they accept that responsibility. And that is just so important because we've seen so many different situations where maybe, um, I know of this one situation where a son who was taking his mother to all of her medical appointments found out when she was in the hospital he thought he was her health care agent found out he was not it was his sister who lived several miles away she thought the brother was also mom had never told them who the health care agent was she'd written it um, in a different state so it's important that um, if you pick someone who will speak for you when you cannot speak for yourself that's what who the health care agent is, that you let them know and that they um, do sign off on it. So we do have five steps in advanced care planning. One is become educated. You're here today. You can mark that one off. Um, remove any barriers. Get the forms. You've also been provided with the forms now. Have the conversations with your family members. They will be relieved. So many times we think that our loved ones don't want to talk about it but they will be relieved if you have that conversation. Complete the forms. It's important to complete that form. Get a cop on your medical record. And um, you know, it used to be that we kind of locked up our health care directive. We put it in the safety deposit box because it's an important document, so we want to keep it safe. We really have the um, 
um, opinion now and the um, practice now of making lots of copies for you. A copy that you can have at your home, a copy that you can give to your health care agent, a copy that you can give to your health care provider. We really recommend that you give a copy to all of your children so that they are all on the same page. Um, we will make as many copies as you need. And then um, take that health care directive with you if you travel. Take it with you if um, when you go see your health care provider, making sure that they have a copy on your chart. And again, across the different health systems, we've really tried to standardize this. And you should have, if you have a health care directive on file at your health care provider, there should be a gold banner across your face sheet. And it will come up and it says health care directive on file. So the next time you go to the doctor, you can say, you know, if you've got one on file, you could say, does it say that? Do I have my gold banner across? So, and then um, the importance too of reviewing and updating these forms. So many times we wrote, you know, we, we wrote it, we said, okay, we got that done, and we never looked at it for maybe 20 years if you had the foresight to get that done. But review it. Um, change it as your wishes change, as your values change, as your health changes. And then, um, there are four people that are kind of involved in this process of advanced care planning. Um, the first person, I, it's different than this slide that I have up here, but the very first person I want to talk about is you, the role that you will have, and that's the most important role. Your role is to really start the process, talk to your loved ones, talk to your health care provider. Um, the facilitator, um, I'm a facilitator for this. We have. At Sanford, we have nurses, we have social workers, we have chaplains who are trained facilitators to help in the process of advanced care planning. And their role is not to tell you what to do, what not to do, but to really help you in that discernment process and really empower you to ask the questions that you might need to ask of your health care provider and really give you the tools to talk to your family and um, really assist you in defining what your preferences might be. And then um, they will be talking to you about things about, like what does a good day look like for you? Um, what trade-offs are you willing to make um, or unwilling to make in light of your health care situation? Is it important to you to have quantity of days or quality of days? Is there some goal? Um, like I have a, um, one of my cohorts who is an advanced care planning facilitator. She, her son is getting married and her father is going through some health issues right now and he really wants to see his grandson get married. And so he's really doing, making health care decisions based on that. So and what outcomes are acceptable to you, unacceptable to you? We'll help you discern all of that. And then we'll talk to you about what are your wishes for physical, emotional, and spiritual comfort. And really talking to you like if, you know, if there's no reasonable chance to regain your life physically or mentally, what would you want? If you have physical limitations but can relate to family and friends, what would you want? If you cannot relate to family and friends, what would you want? So lots of different things that we will be discussing with you. And then um, we'll talk to you about what are your wishes about how you want to live. And again, I want to just re really reiterate that this is just such an important gift that you can um, give your family if you have the conversation with them, if you document what you truly want. As a faith community nurse, I've been able to walk with lots of different people at end of life and walk with lots of different families. And it's been such a blessing. Now, um, situations where, um, what, what you would call like a beautiful death, where the family is gathered around and they are um, helping mom or dad with their last days, it's usually when there's been an advanced care plan done and they know what mom or dad want and they know they are helping mom or dad carry out their wishes. Now, there have been some situations where maybe it has been a little bit tense. <laughs> There's been a lot of stress and anxiety around a person's death and many times it is because they don't know 
what mom or dad want. Um, you may have a couple siblings that want this and a couple siblings that want that, and there's some discord going on. So it's just such a gift you can give your family. And then part of the advanced care planning process too is saying maybe what you want for your funeral. Again, a wonderful gift that you can give your family. We won't you know, do all the funeral planning with you, but we can help you write down a few things that you might want. And then there are decisions that you will need to make in regards to um, CPR, artificial breathing, artificial food and fluids, kidney dialysis, tissue and organ donation. And we'll help you document all of that in your health care directive. And again, I just want to say too that we will not um, tell you what you should do and what you shouldn't do. You may have really um, definite ideas or you may not and we'll help you write statements that will reflect that in your health care directive. At this point, I kind of like to ask if there's any questions about what I've covered so far. Well, and I'll take questions at the end too. But yes, yes. The questions yes. that were on the last couple of slides, are they in here somewhere? Or do we only get those if we have them? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, they really aren't in. Well, it's part of like the, in that starting the conversation, okay. but there's, it's not I mean, maybe I laid out quick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, we will go over that with you, yeah. Anything? Uh, yes, I'm sorry. You mentioned uh, about um, border crossing between. Yeah. Countries. Um, that is a great question. They will, uh, it's important to take your directive with you, and yes, um, they will, they have a process for that too. But they would probably have different forms, but your medical team, if you were in Canada and had some type of um, health crisis that you were in the hospital, they would look at your directive and they would honor it. They would. Yeah. That is a great question, though. And, you know, because we do, because of where we live, we are going. Uh, up into other countries and, and we are a mobile society so it is really important then that you do take your directive with you when you do travel. A lot of people just keep a copy in their glove box. Um, interestingly and this just popped in my head that um, we do know for these younger people in the room you probably aren't going to want to carry around a piece of paper. <laughs> I mean I, and our culture is changing that way. There is a smartphone app and it's called My Healthcare Directive. And soon people will be able to just download that onto their smartphone. And there'll be like a, um, to prove that I think there's, there'll be like a fingerprint um, identification so that they know that it is a valid document. Um, so let's go on a little bit more and then we, if you think of questions, please ask. So we probably all have different visions about, you know, how we, we maybe would want um, our end of life to look like this gentleman here. Um, unfortunately, sometimes it does look like there. And we do know that the medical model is really based on cure and recovery. <laughs> but that may not be what we want or might, might not be possible for us. And your health care provider will kind of help you discern that. Um, but it's important then that you write down what your wishes are if a recovery and a cure is not in the, in the picture at that time. And we will talk to you um, about hospice care, palliative care. So many times people um, don't really understand what that is, but palliative care is for um, anybody who is has a health care, has a health condition that really where recovery and cure might not be in the picture, maybe a chronic disease, and where you would just do comfort measures. I don't want to say just do because that's so important, but where you will do comfort measures, where you, you may still maybe be doing some medical treatment, but it's really to give you comfort, to give you good quality of life. Hospice care includes palliative care. But hospice care is care that is done at when you maybe have six months of life left. And it does include that comfort care. Palliative care can be given in your home, in a nursing home, in the hospital, and part of hospice care. 
Any questions about that? Okay, that's great. So what is your role um, as the, the patient? Um, your role is to talk with your healthcare team, get the support that you need, and learn as much as you can about your health condition. And um, really, in the importance of appointing that healthcare agent. And so many times people say, I don't want to appoint somebody because they'll just kind of take over my, um, a lot of times people say that about their children more, but they, <laughs> they're just going to take over my health care decisions. And it's only if you cannot speak for yourself that that health care agent's role comes into play. And it's really um, by you doing these conversations, by really writing it down, it's a way of showing love to those that you care about. A lot of times it's not easy questions and not easy to um, talk about with your family, but hopefully by starting this process, we will make it easier for you. And then that health care agent. It's really important that um, you know that it's somebody that you can trust, somebody that knows you well, somebody that you're willing to share what's going on with you as far as your health, and is willing to advocate for you, um, and really has that resiliency to stick up for you if there does um, come into play where there's maybe some family discord. It can be anyone over the age of 18. It can be a family member, it can be your spouse, it can be a child, it doesn't have to be your spouse, it doesn't have to be your oldest child, but somebody that you truly trust and um, want to walk with you and to include in on that. Any questions about the healthcare agent? Yes, I, I'm not doing real good at identifying. Oh, I'm curious, if I were to name, say, my husband, uh -huh. my agent, but then we were both in a car accident, he passes away, and I can't mm -hmm. for myself. What happens then, since he's listed as the healthcare We do agent? really recommend that you name two people, and it's in that likelihood that, you know, cause that, because we do know that that could happen. <coughs> um, so then, and if you don't have somebody, they, there's kind of a hierarchy that like the court system would go to and that um, medical and ethical boards would look at if there wasn't somebody. It, you know, it's like spouse, um, children, parents, grandparents. And then sometimes they do do a court-appointed person if, they just, if there just isn't anybody. Does that answer your question? Okay, we would try to encourage you to pick two people. Yes? We encourage that because they do have to sign off on it in North Dakota. We do encourage you to bring your health care agent with. Now, um, you may have somebody that maybe doesn't live in the area. And with the accessibility, with cell phones and stuff, it doesn't have to be somebody that lives in the exact same town as you. Somebody that is accessible, somebody that maybe could travel quickly if needed. So, any other questions about the healthcare agent? Okay. And then um, your healthcare provider. It's important that um, you know that you can ask these questions of your health care provider, that you can, that they really explain what is going on with whatever health diagnosis you may have. Um, it's important that they will talk to you about what your goals are, um, what might happen if you do this treatment, what might not happen. And you need to know too that if your health care provider feels that they can't really carry out what your wishes are, that they have that duty to transfer your care to another health care provider. And, um, but really to know that um, it's important to have the conversations about your end of life when you're not in a stressful situation. So we really encourage people to do that with their primary care provider. Now you may not have anything going on as far as your health right now. So um, it would maybe be a shorter conversation, but as your health changes, it's important to do that with your primary care provider in a non-stressful situation. 
And then we really have really tried to work on that process where your primary care provider would document in your chart, make documentation about what your wishes are, and talk about your, that you do have a health care directive. And then if there is some type of crisis situation where we'll say that um, you were brought in by ambulance um, and you're in the emergency room, the emergency room physician then will have access to that note, will know then what your wishes are for your health care and can follow through with what you've discussed with your primary care provider. We've really tried to make that more seamless. So. And then the importance of finishing that advanced care planning process by getting the documentation <laughs> done. And um, uh, I talked about that, you know, we will help you get that on your electronic record. I talked about the importance of having lots of copies, having, giving copies to those that, um, that are important to you that might be in the presence when you might have a health care situation. But also we say there's kind of five D's of when you need to review your document. And that is in the time, in, um, if there is a death, well, especially if there is, if the person you named as your agent dies, you would want to maybe possibly appoint another person. Um, but many times when we experience the death of a loved one, it maybe changes what we would maybe want at the end of our life also. So that's just a good time to review your documents. Um, if, if there is a divorce, and especially if the person you're divorcing was your health care agent, you might not want them making health care decisions for you. Maybe, maybe not. Um, if you do still want the person that you are divorcing to make health care decisions for you, there is an addendum form that we recommend that you fill out that you still give that person um, that right to make health care decisions for you. But again, it's one of those um, important life moments too where maybe we need to review what we want at, at end of life too. It's just one of those times. And then every decade, you would want to review your document. Now, if you're a little bit ad more advanced in age, maybe every five years you would want to do that. And then if you have a new diagnosis, where maybe it might change what you would want. And then also if you've had a decline in your health, you'd want to review your health care directive. And keep a copy. You know, we've talked a lot about the importance of having lots of copies. So. And um, there's lots of resources that are available to you. Um, these are the numbers for the different health care systems for writing your health care directive. Um, and um, like I said, we at Sanford and at Essentia, we will do it for whoever, and we will help you get it to the appropriate um, health care provider. So any other questions? That's all of my presentation, but so hopefully I covered what you came here to hear and answered your questions. But um, the healthcare directives are, um, and I'm not sure what you're asking by legally binding. Because people sometimes mean a different thing by that, so maybe I better ask what. Right. My brother may not necessarily share that, but it's on record. I'm here. He lives out of state. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times that does happen. Now, if you write in your health care directive what you would want about CPR, mm -hmm. and then appointed a health care agent, and that health care agent was carrying out your wishes. So then, it, yes, it, it's legally binding. Now, if you write, we'll just use this as an example. Say you write that you do not want CPR. You're taken in to the hospital, and there is a need for CPR. And the health care agent who has been appointed as the health care agent is disagreeing with the directive. Um, they would sit down with you and say, OK, what's going on here? 
your mother did not want CPR and you're telling us to do CPR. So there would be a discussion. And they would, a lot of times it does happen though with families where you may have people on opposite sides. And if you've written that healthcare directive, the um, healthcare institution needs to follow it. Yep. Then, you know, many times there's lots of different scenarios um, because our health is complicated. And the healthcare institution needs to follow, out, follow what a healthcare directive says. Um, if there is family that's really disagreeing about it, the physician's uh, team of individuals will sit down and really help the family work through that so that everybody to, can kind of come together and honor mom or dad's wishes. Yeah. Yes. Sure. <laughs> yeah, that, thank you for saying that. So, um, through Honoring Choices, and you will see it says Honoring Choices Minnesota at the bottom. Um, soon these will say Honoring Choices North Dakota. It's just, I mean, it is just like in the last probably six weeks that um, Honoring Choices North Dakota became a 5013C, and so they couldn't really put that on everything. But anyway, and that, you maybe didn't need to know all that. But um, <laughs> so w there is going to be all the, um, in North Dakota and Minnesota, they will be using this form, OK? And now at Essentia or I'm trying to think what it was, some other, oh, anyway, they'll probably have their own logo right there but it will be honored at all the institutions across North Dakota, Minnesota. And um, so, it, you know, it starts out where you will say your name, your date of birth, your address, all of that. Now, if your address should change, it, you don't necessarily have to redo this. You don't, unless your wishes have changed. But we really do that to really identify, you know, if you have a name like Barb Hansen, there's lots of us out there, and so really to identify whose directive it is. And then the first thing you're addressing is my health care agent. And, um, and it does show there that, you know, in North Dakota you have to sign off, and it has kind of the different states that are right in this region what the requirements are. Um, on the second page, that is where you will identify who your agent is and who your alternate agent is. And that kind of goes with that question about if, you're, um, if you name like your spouse and you're both in the same accident. Um, yes? That's for someone who doesn't speak English. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's not the facilitator who, yeah. But great question. Um, and then we will, ex you know, when we sit down, we will really take into account what is going on with you as far as your health, and then what decisions maybe that you would want and not want. And we'll explain each of these individually. What, you know, if you mark, um, like on the third page where it says, my initials below indicate I authorize my health care agent to um, make decisions about the care of my body after death. We'll, we'll tell you kind of what would happen with that. You know, if I live in North Dakota or Minnesota, my initials below indicate I also authorize my health care agent um, to, you know, continue, this is where that addendum, you know, continue as my health care agent even if our marriage or domestic partnership is legally ending or has been ended. So, you know, we'll really try to individualize it to what you might be going through. Um, and then we will address those things that I, uh, that slide that I had about CPR. Um, and there's, you know, you may, some people would maybe want CPR no matter what. That may be a decision that they might make. Some people might make the decision, I don't want CPR ever, you know, so kind of those two, extremes. Now, 
some people, um, and we, I think it's important, well, I know I'm saying what I kind of think myself, but you know, kind of to say a statement too, based on what is going on with your health, you know, I would maybe want CPR in this situation, but maybe not in this situation. And we'll really help you discern that and help you address it. Um, and then um, treatment's about prolonging your life, and that's where dialysis and um, artificial feedings would come into place. And then about organ donation. Any questions so far about the document? Okay. And um, we do have a statement about having an autopsy. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but an autopsy is not covered by your health insurance. And maybe you did know that in this room. But it is not, because your health insurance is for when you are living. An autopsy is done after you die. Health insurance does not cover an autopsy. Isn't that interesting? Now, if, um, if you have a autopsy that is ordered because there's been an unattended death, then it is, like they can do kind of a, there's kind of degrees of autopsies too. And that can be covered by, um, it, it's just covered, if it's ordered legally, then it's just covered by the legal system. But you can't, um, so many times, you know, and I've been with families where there's been a sudden death and, the, and you do want an autopsy so that the family knows but you need to know that it, it will cost several thousand dollars then for the family to know. But sometimes that is just very important if, it's, um, if you want to know if it's something that maybe a child could possibly die of too or, or children. So, but we don't always hear that. So, um, And then, let's see here, autopsy. Um, and then my hopes and my wishes, and that's really where, you know, we do, t and the, so we do kind of have what was on that slide, but things that, you know, make life worth living to you, you know, your beliefs, your thoughts about medical treatments. And some people really write quite a bit in there. Some people really don't write anything. You do need to have something in each blank. Even if you don't have, if you don't want to put anything, you just can put N-A there too. But you do need to have something in each blank, okay? And um, we do have, there is about religious affiliation. And then um, the last part on page eight is about having it notarized. Um, all of the health systems have several notaries on staff, so it can be notarized when you go in for a clinic appointment. We can do that as part of the facilitation process. Or you can go to a bank and have it notarized. You can um, also um, have two witnesses. And it goes into there the requirements of the witness. It can't be your health care provider and it can't be somebody you know, who would benefit from your death too. So. Any questions? And then it's part of the form too. It does encourage you to review it and, and then give copies to many people. And has a place there to really document who you've given copies to. Any questions about the form that I maybe didn't answer? Yes. Okay. So I they, I, they probably did just, so yes, if they requested it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that might be a situation too. But, yeah. Jane. Yeah, I have just one more question. You've, you've talked about um, the, the option of uh, setting up an appointment with a facilitator. Yes. In the, the mm -hmm. area. Right. Um, I'll address that first. You can fill this out on your own. You don't need somebody that is going to tell you to fill in each blank. Just know that you do need to fill in each blank. 
you do need to have it notarized. And you do need, if you are a North Dakota resident, you do need to have um, your health care agent sign off on it. And then, um, Where do they sign off on it? it is on page, um, it's towards the back. Um, <laughs> the, um, I should know this right off. It is, no, there's a place. Yes, on um, page nine, thank you. I accept, I accept this appointment and agree to serve as the agent. Yep. It's like a health care power attorney. Yep, it is. Yes. Yep. So yes, you can do this by yourself. You don't need to have a facilitator walk you through it. Um, but the importance of having it notarized and having your health care agent sign off. If you would like to have a facilitated discussion, um, we can set that up when it's convenient for you. And um, you just call, two th at Sanford, it's 234-6980, Essentia, it's 364-4828. And then Hospice of the Red River Valley will also do home visits. And we will also go out to the home if someone cannot come into our office. And, um, and they will help with that facilitation process. We do encourage you to bring your health care agent. I think somebody asked about that. If that's not possible, that's OK. A good facilitated conversation usually lasts about an hour and a half to really walk through all of the pieces. Um, and if sometimes you just need to kind of mull it around and you have to think about it, we'll do two appointments, three appointments. <laughs> we also try to make it very convenient too. If you have an appointment with a healthcare provider, we can a lot of times piggyback alongside that too. And then um, just to let you know too that we're really trying to get a process where we have um, facilitators in each of like the clinics like if you are a patient in at Northport we're trying to get a facilitator there at South Point in internal medicine in cardiology and nephrology we're trying to really have facilitators where it's convenient for the people so for many of us we work out of spiritual care at Sanford and so that is at the hospital downtown did I answer that Okay. <laughs> you know, some of when you work with it so much, you're just kind of like, oh, yeah. <laughs> but, yes? So what if you fill it out and you have a person like your agent, whatever, but you never get it notarized? So if somebody comes in with one... That's not notarized? Yeah. Will it still be followed? Or? It, it would be. be. Especially if the people, um, like, say... You say your spouse is going to be your agent, but you just didn't get it notarized, but you came in with it, and your spouse is there, and he's agreeing with what you've written down. Yeah. Yeah. And it really is, I do really want to say how important that conversation is. Because even if you don't even bring the document with, but, you know, your children are there, your spouse are there, and everybody's agreeing, they're going to carry out your wishes. They are. So... Yes. Yep. You, and what I would do would, um, you know, I don't think it's on Honoring Choices North Dakota yet. That's a great question. But um, you can just write in healthcare directive. Um, and I would do the Honoring Choices because it is, it's a lot easier. It's just so the language is, I think, a lot easier. So, but yes, you can get it online. And you can, um, we can send out these packets if you call the Sanford number two, and we can send them out to anybody too that might need them. We've got a few extra packets too, if somebody wanted to take one. Yeah, please take them, because it's, the, we just want the information out. I will have on the extension website, if you just Google 